Okay, well, evening everyone. If you haven't met me before, my name is Tim, and it's good to see you. I think I've, I've met most of you before. Well, that was a bit different, wasn't it? Um, I need to put on a list of things to chat to Grant about. More, more pan pipe solos in the future. <laughs> Maybe organise a little children's choir. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, it's, it's lovely to have live instruments and things with us, we normally do, but uh, as I said, yeah, it's just nice to be able to sing together, actually, that was why I just learned them. Anyway, uh, you know the classic movie trope, uh, I see. In the Wild West, picture the scene, town troubled by bandits and villains, um, you know, the, the tumbleweed rolls down the street, the dust fills the air, all the town's residents are, are um, closing them off behind shuttered windows in, in fear. Uh, until a mysterious stranger rides through the town, uh, gets off his horse, he sort of barges through the, the bars, swing doors, uh, clinks his boots off on the floor as he goes in, shoots the bad guy, saves the town, kisses the girl, uh, stamps out a cigar, gets on his horse, and rides off west into the sunset. Yeah, you know, you know how that bit works. Well, if you've been joining us this term, uh, well, you'll know that we've been working through Mark's Gospel, haven't we? And we've reached the very end of the book tonight, the last part uh, this, this evening. So how did it begin? You might remember Mark 1, verse 1. This is the beginning of the gospel uh, of, about Jesus, who is the Christ, number one, and the Son of God, number two. And maybe also you might remember the healing of the blind man that came in two parts, halfway through the book. So Jesus laid his, his hands on this man he couldn't see, and immediately he, he could see, but he could only kind of, kind of see. Everything was a bit fuzzy to him. People looked like kind of trees walking around and out of focus. And then Jesus laid his hands up again, and this time uh, the man could see in full. And that story was, was meant to be a picture of Jesus' disciples, especially Peter. Uh, Peter who announced at, at that point, Jesus, you are the Christ. Uh, he finally got it. But as we saw, Peter only got half of who Jesus was. He understood that Jesus was was the Christ, the all-powerful and authoritative king of glory. Uh, but he, he couldn't also see that Jesus had to be the suffering servant, the one who would suffer to rescue his people. He, Peter was kind of, spiritually speaking, he was half blind. He could only half see the truth. And then what we saw last week, the climax of the whole book, really, everything brought together. Jesus was crowned and robed in purple. He was the king. And yet he was dying on a cross. He was the suffering servant. He was the servant king uh, dying for his people. And Mark 15, 41. Who is it that gets that, the second half, that, that Jesus is the son of God? Well, it's not, a, it's not a disciple. It's not someone on the inside. It's not even a Jew at all. It's a, it's a centurion, a pagan Gentile, miraculously. He says, truly, this was the son of God. This man is the, is the one suffering in his Servanthood. This man is, is clearly the true emperor of the world, he says in effect, in kind of Roman speak. It's treasonous and nothing else, but he gets it. So that's it. Mark's intro statement is fulfilled. Uh, Jesus is the Christ, Peter said that. Jesus is the Son of God, the centurion said that. But just before Mark uh, kind of rides off into the sunset, so to speak, there are two more crucial scenes that are going to bring uh, this book to a close. Let's read them together, shall we? We're going to read from where we left off last time, from Mark 15, 42. When you find it in your Bibles uh, as we get there, and we're going to read um, into chapter 16 as well. But let's, let's pray together and ask God's help, shall we, as we look at that. Father, we thank you so much for Mark's Gospel. We thank you for this picture of, of Jesus in his glory and in his, in his suffering servanthood, this picture of the servant king. And Father, all the way through what we've been seeing this term, we, we have heard this call to follow him. And tonight, Father, for wherever we are with Jesus, whether we have been following him for years, whether we're still investigating those claims, Father, I pray that you would reveal Jesus to us more clearly this evening through your word as we come to it now. Amen. Okay, let's, let's read that from chapter 15, verse 42. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, 
he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And we'll leave it there. Now you might notice in your Bibles there's a little... Uh, there's a little note there under verse, under verse 8, you might have that there. It says something like the earliest manuscripts do not include verses 9 to 20. You might see that there, Need a little nod if you can see that. Um, well, that basically means that the, the, rest of the, the rest of the verses were almost certainly added later by another editor or redactor or something of this gospel. Um, the, some ancient copies of this book have those verses in, some have got a kind of different combination of verses, but the earliest ones that we have do not. They stop at verse 8. Uh, sometimes you'll hear people say things like, oh, the Bible editors are just trying to, you know, the Bible's written to hoodwink you or trick you, or, you know, if you don't you get movies like the Da Vinci Code, you know, those hidden secrets about the Bible that they don't tell you about. Well, to put it frankly, they, <laughs> nothing's hidden from you here. It's all, it's all there. They've put in all the text that we have, uh, but they've just put that little note there so you know that actually these last verses uh, aren't in the very earliest manuscript. So you can read it if you want to, um, but it's, it's probably not God's word. So why did someone want to add a bit extra to the end of Mark? Well, I think it's probably because if we, if we stop at verse 8, it feels a little bit jarring, doesn't it? It's, a, it's kind of a cliffhanger. Um, you know, what happens, what happens next, Mark, you might ask? You've got three frightened women who are running away from, from this tomb in trembling and astonishment. But where do they go? Did the disciples uh, get told? Did they go and meet Jesus in Galilee? Mark doesn't tell us. But I think that Mark has ended this gospel perfectly, just as it is. And I say that because by leaving it there, Mark asks us the exact question that he's been asking us all along. What do you make of Jesus? What are you going to do with this? Are you going to answer his call? Just like he's, just like he's presenting these women in that exact same situation. And actually the whole passage has this theme of, of discipleship running all the way through it. This passage is about fear... And it's about courage. Fear versus courage. Now, let me show you that. So first of all, we have these women, don't we? We've already kind of talked a little bit about them. They are alarmed when they see the angel sitting by the tomb side, maybe understandably so. And then when they begin to realise what's happened, when they get told what's happened, they are even more afraid and they, they kind of run off. Uh, but it's not just them, because the obvious question might be, well, you know, these women are at the tomb side, where are the men? Uh, where have they gone? You know, verse 3, women ask each other, who's going to roll away the big stone? In other words, they're, they're saying to each other, you know, Mary, I know you've been in this Pilates class for a while, but I saw that stone, it was massive. You know, where, where are Peter and Andrew and James and John? Who's, who's going to help us roll this thing away? And I think the answer is that the disciples are well, they're hiding. Uh, Peter certainly is hiding after he denied Jesus three times uh, out of fear for his life. And, and that's what the others are doing. They are afraid of what the authorities might do to them if they get caught. So they are hiding. And we're also reminded a little bit here of the fear of Pilate. So Pilate is sympathetic to the disciples. Uh, he, he allows Joseph of to take the body away, doesn't he? And it kind of reminds us of how, how before Jesus died, Pilate was, was aware that Jesus was innocent. He, he, um, he interviewed Jesus, he questioned him before his death, and he knew that Jesus was, was not guilty of anything. And yet, when it came to the crunch, when the crowd were baying for Jesus' death, when it counted, 
Pilate was a coward, and he handed an innocent man over to death. Fear, in various guises, kind of runs through this passage. But it's contrasted with courage. Uh, so there's the women, of course, already who are being willing to go and anoint Jesus' body, unlike others. But there's also Joseph of Arimathea. Now, what does it say about, in, about him in verse 43? It says, Joseph took courage and went to Pilate to ask for the body. Now, why is that courageous, you might ask? Well, what do we learn about Joseph? Joseph's looking for the kingdom of God, Mark says. In other words, you know, maybe he's heard Jesus teach. Maybe he's seen him, followed him around Jerusalem. Maybe he's seen him heal people. Um, but whatever, it seems that he's come to a point where he's wanting to follow Jesus in faith. But Joseph, beginning of verse 43, he's also a respected member of the council, it says. So the council is, is the Sanhedrin, the, the kind of Jewish religious authority of the day. And throughout Mark, it's been that council that has been dead set against Jesus. The council that schemed and uh, tried to have Jesus killed and put him on trial for blasphemy. So Joseph has a big choice to make now. Uh, because there's a problem. So verse 42 tells us that it's the end of the day on the Friday. So, so Jesus has died on the cross and late in the afternoon on Friday and sunset is coming in and very soon it's going to be the Sabbath. And what does that mean? Uh, if you're not familiar with your kind of Jewish customs, well, if, it, if, the, if the sun sets and it becomes a Sabbath, then it's going to be illegal under Jewish law to take uh, a dead body down from the cross and do something with it. Um, but... The other problem is that if they leave it over there for the, for the Sabbath, then the Romans will then dispose of the body instead. And, and uh, you know, uh, Gentiles would take the body and they would just do what Romans would do with it. They would effectively desecrate it from a Jewish point of view. So, so they, time is not on their side here. They've got to do something quickly. So in going to Pilate to collect the body, Joseph has to take courage. He has to effectively stick his hand up and say, yeah, I'm a follower of this man. I want to uh, help protect this guy's um, body. In effect, the whole council is going to hear of it, and they're going to know that he's a, he's a Christian. But that's just what he does. In a race against time, he, he goes and buys it in the shroud, he wraps the body in it, he buries uh, the body. Uh, Matthew's Gospel adds that he has to, has to use the tomb that he's himself had kind of cut out for his own burial one day, because time was so short. So Jesus gets buried in Joseph's tomb. And then presumably, he hurriedly runs off and, and you know, does his ceremonial washing ready for the Sabbath. Fear versus courage, that's the theme running through this whole passage. And that's why chapter 16, verse 8 is such a perfect ending to this gospel. What about you, Mark is asking? Are you going to be bound by fear into silence? Or will you take courage? Will you stick your head above the parapet like Joseph and follow Jesus where he's going? Mark's framed this whole book this way, really, hasn't he? Uh, every stage, as we've uncovered Jesus' identity all the way through, he's been asking this question. How will you respond to Jesus? He's been showing us different people and their different responses. What about you? Will you follow this man? Remember Mark 8, 34? This is the very middle of the book, the very centre point. This is what Jesus says. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? But whoever is ashamed of me, he goes on, and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And when you read that, you might understand why there's so much fear in this passage. Following Jesus is, is scary when it's framed like this. Take up your cross. Uh, losing our lives, the Son of Man, the one with authority to judge the living and the dead, being ashamed of people when he comes just think what happened to the 12 apostles for a start i mean i don't know whether all the traditions about the way they died are, are all true probably some of them are but if so then then all but one of them were killed violently in various places europe asia or africa um 
from beheadings to clubbings to stabbings to burnings to crucifixions. And the last one, he didn't die violently, died in exile uh, on an island. Now, we don't face the same kind of persecution as, as, as they did, do we? Or, in fact, and like many people around the world, as Christians do today in China or North Korea or a whole range of other places, uh, let's not pretend that we are persecuted in that sense. But, but what we face, typically, is relational hardship. You know, if you, if you are like Joseph and you stand up for Jesus and you stick your hand in the air and say, yeah, I'm his follower, then you are going to have difficult, awkward conversations with people. You might be made fun of or insulted or ostracised. Uh, you might have friends leave you. You may even have family members abandon you or turn their back on you. I know that there are some, even in this, even in this smaller community of Jerry Street, let alone the whole church, that that is true for. And none of that is to be taken lightly. When I was an undergrad at Exeter Uni, I had a friend, uh, let's call him Dean, and he was studying theology. And he said that it, he said to me in his first term, he just started out at university during a tutorial class with about twenty other s- students. Uh, his his lecturer's teacher asked them to put their hands up if they believed that the Bible was the inerrant word of God. And Dean put his hand up straight away, but he was surprised to look around and find not only did not many other theology students have their hands up, but most people were looking at him like it was an absolute nutcase. And then his teacher told him that, and, and a couple of others, that if they wanted to have a good grade for that term, then they'd need to read the literature very carefully and make sure they came to an intelligent conclusion, which is quite a thinly veiled threat, really, isn't it? Uh, so he spent the whole term every essay he came to wondering exactly what he was going to put, knowing that his teacher had the, maybe had the power to fail him or at the very least make his life awkward for him in class and make some difficult relationships with the students for him. We face moments like Joseph Thurmfear or like Dean all the time. Uh, Joel, you shared, a, you shared a few weeks ago how you, know, you had that moment in, in the CU when you had to stick your hand up and, and uh, share with your whole class about an event that was going on. Effectively saying, yeah, I'm a Christian. That's a moment to, to stand up and put your hand in the air. Well, maybe in those moments, we might, we might feel like those women at the tomb, uh, a bit overwhelmed and unsure and even afraid of what others might think about us. But again, Mark leaves it here to ask us that question. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? But of course, so far we've missed the blinding the obvious in this passage, haven't we? We've not really talked about Jesus himself. But Mark establishes two facts in this passage, two facts that will change absolutely everything for us. So fact number one, Jesus was dead. Jesus was dead. And Mark is at pains to establish that fact for us. He writes the end of chapter 15 almost like he's sort of describing a legal court case or something. So first of all, he introduces his expert witness, Uh, Joseph asks Pilate for Jesus' body, so 44, Pilate checks with the centurion. Now, why does he check with the centurion? Because the centurion has probably been involved in the death of dozens, if not hundreds, of uh, prisoners on crosses. He knows what it looks like when someone is dead on a cross. And Roman soldiers, if, if if there was any doubt at all, they would finish the job off themselves with a sword or a spear, which we know from other gospel accounts is what happened in Jesus' case. Um, Pilate's surprised that Jesus died so quickly. Normally it's a, kind of, it's a case that lasts a few days. People, people last on the cross a few days as they eventually get too tired to lift themselves up on the nail. They, they die of lack of air in the end and just tiredness. Uh, but Jesus is no ordinary crucifixion, was it? So the centurion says, yeah, this guy was dead. And so that's good enough for Pilate. Uh, then... Joseph himself takes the body and puts it in a tomb, wrapping it in in linen. And we've already seen that Joseph is not a witness that you might expect. He's a member of the council. He's not someone who you think, oh, this guy's just Jesus' best mate or brother or something. He's obviously bound to say whatever you want him to say. No, this is the kind of witness you don't expect to take the stand. But he says, no, Jesus was dead. I buried him myself. And then finally, Mark gives us the witness of two additional kind of corroborated bystanders. He just puts in there, verse 47, two women also saw where he was laid. Then there's the evidence. Jesus has been wrapped in cloth. He's been put in a grave. There's a huge stone that's been put in front of the tomb entrance. Uh, in effect, Mark's saying, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, 
I rest my case. Jesus was definitely dead. No doubt about it. There is no human explanation for what is about to happen next. Because what becomes clear in chapter 16 is that this was all part of the plan. Uh, the women go early on Sunday morning to the tomb and they find an angel who says, this is verse 6, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go. Tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Just as he told you. It's all part of the plan. Three times in this gospel so far, Jesus has spelled out for his disciples what is going to happen. I'm going to die, he says, and three days later, I'm going to rise. So it's happened, just as he told you. Even his movements now uh, come across like a man of the plan. He's going before you to Galilee, the angel says. He's travelling out of Jerusalem. You know, the last half of this gospel has been Jesus' journey towards Jerusalem, towards what's going to happen to him there. Well, now he is, he is off. He is off to Galilee. First steps towards the rest of the world. He's a man on a mission. A man with a plan. But there's more that Mark wants us to see, actually, about this incredible uh, turn of events. Look back at verse 2. Mark wants us to know exactly when this happened. It's weird. He, he spells out the timing of this in immense detail. Very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. Now, why, why say that so clearly? Well, it's because what happened in Jerusalem at that tomb is not just a man coming back from the dead, as if that was a small thing. What has happened very early on that morning is the dawning of an entire new age in creation history. So Genesis says that God created the world in, in seven days. Now, we won't, we won't bother arguing about how literal that's going to be taken right now. That's, that's not really the point. For the purpose of this passage in Mark, the point is, is that picture of a creation week. Let there be light, God said. And there was light. The beginning of the first day, a Sunday. And then Monday and Tuesday, the, the second and third days, God, uh, the waters and the sky and the land were all created. And then Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, days four, five and six, the waters and the sky and the land were all filled with fish and birds and animals. And then Saturday rolls around, day seven, and God rests from creating things. Until the end of Mark chapter 15. When the women are still sitting around gathering spices and crying on that Saturday evening, worrying about the next morning and the future and, and everything that's going to happen now, Jesus has died. In a cosmic kind of creation week sense, it was still that very first Saturday. God was still at rest from his creating work. All the time from Adam and Eve to Mary and Mary, God has been resting. That's part of what Jesus means in Mark 2 when he says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Oh, that's kind of another story. But now, Mark says, chapter 16, verse 1, it is the beginning of the first day of the week. It's a new Sunday. The sun has risen. Pun intended. Do you get the scale of what Mark's hinting at here? The women at the tomb sure didn't. But you see, the Bible is like the, the story of two weeks. It's a creation fortnight. The first creation we described in Genesis 1, but the second one has begun. Something new is happening. As Christ rose from the tomb, God's creating work began anew. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Christ is the first fruits from the dead. The first of a new creation. All this means, like the angel said, you do not need to be afraid. Therefore, says Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, he says. Behold, the new has come. We're being transformed into Christ's image with ever-increasing glory. Guys, we stand now on, on this resurrection. We stand on the resurrection of Christ in the kind of middle middle of the fortnight of creation. 
All of what has been made behind us, this whole new creation, is in front of us. We can look forward to all of the, those scenes at the end of Revelation. One day when God's new creation is complete, when we reach that final Sabbath, that final rest again, and we spend the whole of eternity on that, on that second and ultimate Saturday. Everything has now changed because of that event in the tomb. But we still fear, don't we? And that's because it often doesn't feel like everything's changed. The world around that Jerusalem tomb just kind of kept on ticking that day. Uh, people kept on selling things in the nearby marketplaces. Captains of ships kept loading up their, uh, the docks. People kept eating and drinking in their homes and making plans for that week. And right now, I know you're, you're full of pudding, you're, you're <laughs> fighting hard with your eyelids, and you're distracted by worries about your dissertation this coming week. But this is the bizarre tension of this world. It's that the first sunrise of that new creation is, is still breaking through on the horizon. And so it often doesn't feel like anything's changed. But everything has changed. God's resurrection power is at work in you. By his spirit, you are being transformed from one glory into another glory, even as you sit here now, hearing the word of God preached. And being a Christian is, is pretty much about realising that. It's about realising the implications of that change more and more and more. You don't need to be afraid anymore, Mark saying. Like Joseph and like Dean and, and like Joel on that day, you can stick your hand in the air and say, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. Well, that's pretty dark, they might say. Or I can't believe you would sign up for something so intolerant, they might think. But guess what? Jesus is risen. A man has conquered death. All the rules have, been, have changed now. On that day, in that tomb, the new creation began. The empty tomb points us to, to the reality of, of the risen new creation Jesus, the Son of Man, the King of Glory, coming on the clouds. That's now certain in future because of what's happened in that, at that tomb. The tomb stands like a kind of empty, yawning gateway into a new dawn, a new age for all of reality and history. And you need to realise that that same spirit, that same resurrection power, is now at work in you. Making you part of this new creation as well. Transforming you. Those women, they didn't stay scared uh, and fearful for long, did they? they? They obviously went and told the other disciples, otherwise we wouldn't be reading this because no one would have written it down. But Mark ends it this way to ask you, are you going to live in fear? Or will you be filled with this courage? Will you get this? Will you, will you understand that in this new creation age, you can have courage? Will you follow Jesus to the ends of the world, if need be, to spread the news of his creation age? It's the end of Mark. It's the end of the show. It's, you know, it's time for the credits to roll. But Jesus is not a cowboy riding off into the sunset. It's not really the end of the story, is it? It's a new beginning. Jesus is the king of glory, he risen from the dead, and he's not running off into the sunset, he's running off into the sunrise. The sun is rising on the new creation right now. So will you follow him? Let's pray. Father, we, we give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honour for what you have done. You have risen Jesus from the dead. And it's something that, as Christians, we think about all the time. And so I think we lose the marvel of that. We lose the significance, not just of the, of the physical thing you've done, but of, the, of what that means for the whole of creation. You are not at rest anymore. You are creating a new. You are at work renewing all things through your gospel of your son. And Father, I pray for each and every one of us here that you would fill us with courage by your Spirit as we grasp that truth, that the, the rules, the things that we are worried about in this world, that that doesn't matter anymore because a man who was dead is alive and is going to come back 
and is the king of glory and he is the one who we follow he is our king he is our champion father fill us with courage as we as we look to him and realize what we have in him i pray these things that that even this christmas that you would use us that you'd use us individually you'd use us as a church to proclaim faithfully the good news of jesus and for those here amongst us who um, who don't yet know and follow this Jesus. Father, I pray for, for all of us that you would lead us more and more to understand and to see Jesus for who he is. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Matt. Okay, we're going to sing another couple of songs uh, and, and then uh, I'll hand over to Ben after that. So let's stand, shall we?